good snacks back there. Um, I'm Kelly Spaven, and I just wanted to welcome all of you this morning and thank you for being here for the first gallery lecture series of our 2018 fall series. Um, this lecture series is kind of put together in conjunction with our Harcom Gallery exhibit, which is currently documented perspectives on migration and creation. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to walk through the exhibit and check it out, I would encourage you to stay a few minutes after today's lecture and maybe walk through and check out all the really cool artwork and research that we've got in there. Um, so this morning, we are welcoming Dr. Marta Camuro Santangelo and Dr. Tamara Falakov. Uh, they'll be discussing their recent service learning course in a presentation titled Voices from Our Neighbors, Immigration Journeys to Lawrence. Dr. Caminero Santangelo is a professor in the Department of English here at KU. She's also the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and the interim director of the Hall Center for Humanities. She earned her PhD in English from the University of California, Irvine, and her research in the field of 20th and 21st century Latinx literary studies focuses on the conjunction between literature group identity, and the ability to promote social change. <coughs> Dr. Falakov is a professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies here at KU, and she is also the Associate Dean for Research in the Arts and Humanities for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. She earned her PhD in communication from UC San Diego. Her specialty is Latin American cinema, as well as the increased importance of global film festivals and how these platforms for exhibition and potential distribution enable Latin American filmmakers to make inroads to the global market. So please join me in welcoming Drs. Marta Caminero Santangelo and Tamara Falikov. Thank you all so much for being here. I apologize for my voice, but I'm going to project and tell you a little bit about the genesis for this project. I had always wanted to do something around the topic of immigration, though my field is film industry, cinema, uh, film festivals. And so I was brainstorming, how, how do we do this? Because, of course, as you see, the generalized media landscape portrays new citizens, new immigrants to this country in a really, really pejorative way. And as a child of immigrants myself, I thought that there had to be something that we could do with students. <coughs> and it seemed to me that, unfortunately, given our segregation in our country, a lot of students don't have an opportunity to meet new immigrants. And so I was thinking about um, a columnist out of California that his column is called Meet a Mexican. And I just thought, how smart, you know, it's a form of education if people can interact and meet each other. And so when I learned about the Center for Service Learning, I became a participant in Linda Dixon's class where um, I was made more aware about the dynamics of having community groups and university groups intersect. That oftentimes there can be a power dynamic where the university people think they know what's best for the community. And so I learned about how perhaps we could partner with a community organization and find out what would be useful for them. How do students bring any skills that would help the mission of the organization? And so after taking the service learning class, I thought, wow, what if we taught a course, a jointly taught course, with an expert on immigration and representations on immigration, and that would be Marta Caminero Santangelo, and have the students learn more about these prevalent images, learn to deconstruct them. Marta's going to talk more about the class and the themes. But then we partner with an organization like Centro Hispano, which is in Lawrence, and we're going to have Lydia Devault speak a little bit about that organization in a minute, where the students get to know a new immigrant, and they get to interact and talk with them about their immigration journey. Maybe they could create an oral history to, to begin and, and start to talk with one another. And then at the end of the class, the culmination was an interview on video about the immigration journey to Lawrence, with the idea being that once we could call the interviews together, this could be a fundraiser for Centro Hispano, which is such an important institution for new immigrants to Lawrence. And this way, we could also make it more visible, which is, of course, a big problem. So I'm going to turn over uh, 
the platform to Marta to talk a little bit more about the class and the students that were in our class. So um, I was actually really grateful to Tamara because, as she said, it was her idea to team teach this course. And my um, firm belief as a literature professor is that stories are powerful and can move us in ways that um, statistics and numbers and facts and um, sound bites cannot. And so um, when I'm teaching classes on immigration themed um, topics, what I'm trying to do is get my students to connect to the stories. Um, and they can be told equally powerfully, I think, in different ways in literature and in film. Um, so this class, we structured it around um, different kinds of immigration stories and we had a, a system where we would um, look at a film on a theme and then look at the literature on the theme. So we were going back, moving back and forth between the literature and the film. Um, we started out with something that was probably closest to most of the students' experiences, which is just um, the experiences of immigrants growing up in the U.S. as immigrants. So that was our first theme. Um, and then we went to something that was probably pretty remote from a lot of student experiences, which was um, fleeing repression in the home country. Um, and then we went to topics like um, what happens when children get left behind in their home countries because their parents immigrate, so family separation, or the reverse, um, what happens if um, families are in the U.S. and the parents get deported, and so family separation happens that way. And for each of these, we were looking at one or more films plus a book. So we were looking at um, documentary film and what do you call it? Fictional film. Um, and we were looking at novels and memoirs and narrative journalism, which is journalism that's written in a gripping um, novel-esque way. Um, let's see, fleeing repression, children left behind, oh, illegal crossings, so uh, some stories of actually crossing the border. Um, and we ended with the stories of DREAMers and DACA students. So we were ending with some personal narratives um, by DACA students. What I loved about the service learning project um, is precisely that students were being asked to talk to immigrants in Lawrence in their communities about their stories and hear their stories. Um, and so there was that um, very personal connection uh, to somebody else's story that they might never have encountered had they not been asked to, to elicit that story for people. Um, I was very, Tamara was the one who was doing all of the service learning um, film logistics. I was really hands off for, for everything having to do with film, light, camera, interviews, all of that, um, Tamara took over. Uh, but I think our students, although they, they uh, certainly felt pressure um, because the stakes they knew were high because they wanted to do a really good job for Centro Hispano, um, that they got a lot out of it. And so you wanted to talk a little yes. bit more about the logistics? Sure. Okay. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the production process for those faculty here who might want to try to create your own service learning class because I think it is incredibly valuable that the students get their learning opportunities outside the classroom. In fact, I'm now fundraising for the college and learning that alums remember most what they did outside of class and not in class. So well, let's try to do both if we can. So, right? So the students, first of all, one thing really interesting about the student population, I had kind of a, a stereotype in my mind of who was going to take the class. I was totally surprised. The vast majority of students were first generation immigrants themselves. So you can imagine, I'm already getting goosebumps thinking about this again, they all had their own stories. Um, my family came over from Argentina. I'm a Russian, Jewish, Argentine, American. Marta's parents are Cubans who came over. So we both are first generation. Our students were as well. So we all have these stories we can tell. So we felt very validated, I think, as a group. But then they had to learn how to use the tools of production. Only three of the students were film majors. Everyone else was an English major or journalism. So we had to do this quick and dirty, come to film and media studies. We have an amazing sound stage in Summerfield Hall. If you haven't visited it, it's incredible. You can rent out the space. I had faculty in film and media who are production faculty who volunteered their time to train them. We had like a two-hour block. It was really crazy, I will admit. 
I think next time we would have to draw it out a bit more. But they familiarize themselves with lighting and camera. They, as we said earlier, they uh, audio taped the story and then learned a little bit about digital storytelling where they took the best pieces in their mind of the story and then asked the participant to reiterate the story, but this time on film. Now listen, this is a precarious group of people. They're not necessarily going to feel comfortable telling their story if they're undocumented. So we learned about silhouette lighting. We learned about ways to protect anonymity. So we were conscious of that, of course. The students, and you're going to see the work that they did, but remember when you watch this, this is a first time video production escapade that these students <laughs> took on in groups. They had to work together. That was tough sometimes. But ultimately, as much as they were very challenged sometimes, I think they felt that this was valuable. And thanks to Lydia and Giselle Scott, they were always there coordinating between their clients and our students, which you need a really strong partner for this to work. Otherwise, it will fall apart. And then we had a benefit at the Artera Gallery last semester where hopefully we raised a decent amount of money. If anything, it's a way to communicate a message that maybe you haven't heard that often. So I'm going to turn uh, this over now to Lydia Diebold to talk a little bit about Century Thank you. So we were incredibly thankful that um, Tamara and Marta approached us and wanted to collaborate on this project. Um, the storytelling was not only powerful for the students, but it was powerful for our clients as well. The fact that someone wanted to hear their stories and wanted to put their stories out there during this very difficult time for undocumented immigrants and documented immigrants was, um, was especially um, empowering for our students. Um, what we do at Centro Hispano is we provide mental health counseling and case management um, for Latinx families who are primarily Spanish speaking. Um, the typical demographic of a family that we serve is a family of mixed citizenship status, meaning you may have some who are U.S. citizens, some who are permanent legal residents, some who have DACA, and some who may not have any documentation at all. The typical makeup is two undocumented parents and um, one or more documented U.S. citizen children. Um, the majority of the families that we, we serve are from, I'd say 75% of the families we serve are from um, an area of Mexico called Guerrero. It means warrior. Um, and they are from these um, rural indigenous communities. Spanish is their second language. Their first language is Clapanec or Mixtec. Sometimes that can be a little bit um, uh, of a challenge in serving people if their Spanish is a, on a very elementary level. Um, but we figured out um, ways to do that. Um, and we work with families to help them find pathways to documentation whenever possible and um, help them access their community resources. Um, this film was wonderful. It helped us um, raise funds. We raised um, $2,000. Um, at the Artera Gallery event, and that is has gone towards um, utility assistance, um, extracurricular activities for the kids, um, extras that we don't have the funds for. Um, and then also it helped us take in quite a few tamale orders for our DACA scholarship fund. And Marta is on our DACA scholarship um, committee. And um, so we were able to give um, seven um, DACA students um, scholarships of $1,000 um, for the school year, 500 per semester, actually, and 150 more for books, so um, $1,300 for the, for the whole year, which was amazing. And I tried to invite the, well, I did invite the DACA students to come and, and speak today, but fortunately, they're busy studying and working, so um, that was that was a, a positive thing. So the fact that they're not there is actually something that I think is pretty good. Um, we love this collaboration. This was fun. It was nice that 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 the university took an interest in our center, wanted to collaborate with our center, and one of the things that really meant a lot to me was that Marta and Tamara we're always putting the families first, always being very careful, protecting their confidentiality, making sure that they felt comfortable with what was going on, and making sure that also that this wasn't just the university taking something from the center, but that it was a reciprocal, um, meaningful, beneficial relationship that was very symbiotic. And 
uh, the families reported afterwards that it really meant something to them to be able to tell their story. So I hope that we can do more of this. I hope that the university does more of this with other agencies and the community. I think it's wonderful to have that kind of partnership. It's great for the students, it's great for the agencies, and um, I'm just really thankful for everything and how well it all went. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for viewing our project, and maybe we can turn the lights on and... Um, Lydia had a couple of things she wanted to add. Okay, so Lydia will say a few things, and then Jibet Encarnacion was a student who worked on the film, and so we may rely on her for her insights if people have questions. Sorry, I just wanted to point two things out from the film before I forget, because I, I think that they're really important. Um, first of all, the woman who was talking uh, about um, Centro Hispano helping her bring her children back, um, that was another collaborative relationship with the university. Um, Brent Metz, who was on our board when we first started, um, helped connect me with Rachel Cross, who was an anthropology student. And when she graduated from the university, she became our AmeriCorps. And at the end of her AmeriCorps service, Rachel actually went to Mexico and brought back with her five children. Um, and um, out of those five children, Three months later, after Rachel had moved to Colorado, um, mom discovered that one of the children had cancer. And so that child wouldn't be here with us today um, if she hadn't been allowed to come back into the United States. She has a medical card. She's a US um, citizen. So that was something that we were incredibly thankful for. And Brent has always been a really good friend to the university. So that's another collaborative relationship that I wish that I had had brought up um, earlier. And the last thing I wanted to say, the young man in the, the film, the DACA recipient, he hasn't just been a DACA scholar. Um, he has volunteered. He has come and helped make tamales. He has helped sell tamales. He, his, his parents have come and helped make tamales, sell tamales. They volunteered and helped out on various things at the center. And he is always giving back as are many of the other DACA scholars who have brought in things like school supplies for the kids at the beginning of the school year. Even though they have very little, they have come back and they have given back as much as they can in the ways that they can. So I just wanted to add that. I felt this was important. Thank you so much, Lydia. Are there any questions from the group? We would love to hear your feedback and uh, questions, clarifications. The video is still a work in progress. We're, you know, still could edit it some more. Yes. This was just beautiful in the first place. I mean, visually, it was really nice to put together. The stories were great. But what will you do with it? How will you promote this out? Who gets to see it? Great question. Well, um, we will be putting it on our website at, at some point. Um, we're working on building that. Obviously, we operate on a shoestring budget. Um, there are three of us. None of us are 40 hours a week. We're all part-time, even though we often work more than, than that. Um, we don't have a ton of funding for someone to build us a website. We have kind of a, a, a bare-bones website, but we hope to post that on the website. Um, we will show it when we go and we, we, we speak to different organizations so that they can have a better understanding of, of what we do. Um, I will show it in social work classrooms. Um, I will show it when I go and I, I, I um, visit or, or give a lecture here at KU and I'll show it when I go out into the community. So um, this film will, will be seen quite a bit. Um, Ten years ago, Maybe 12 years ago, Brent Metz, um, I know I'm talking about Brent a lot, but he's done a lot for the center. Um, he made a film, and that film's a little outdated now. Um, so we needed something new to kind of um, tell the story and also promote what we do at, at the center. So this is really quite invaluable for us because we would have never been able to do something like this on our own. So. Come on, folks, you are all intellectuals here. I know you have ideas and questions. Yes? I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how, in one semester, you went from not having a film to having a film. Because, I mean, just to be trying to take oral histories would take a semester. Um, so could you just talk about how that worked? That might be a good one for Jibet to chime in on. Yes. How about Jibet? So you'll get the student perspective, and then I can tell you a little bit about just the, the nuts and bolts. Great question, though. 
It is a good question, because we were asking ourselves that very same question <laughs> up until like a week before it was ready. Um, so yeah, we in the class took, uh, watched a lot of different documentary films, so we were already like pretty familiar with the whole idea of taking these, um, these testimonials. Um, so yeah, we knew what was supposed to be the product, and then we had a lot of very um, you know, hands-on training. We had a day when they like took us through how to do the cameras, how to do the lighting, like that blackout lighting. Our lighting people were able to um, to teach us how to do, um, and yeah, a lot of in-class work and uh, the Centro Hispano helped a lot to like help connect us with the people on a short on a short notice. Um, so yeah, it, we were very worried it wasn't going to come together, but then it did. So it was good. <laughs> we should also give a lot of credit to Meg Jameson in the film department, who came on a couple of occasions, as I recall, and spoke to our class. And um, Meg outlined, I mean, we were all aware that we had to do this just super fast, because um, Cynthia Respano was having its big fundraiser the very last weekend of class, so it had to be ready for that. Um, come hell or high water. So Meg's idea was um, that the students should have a conversation with their collaborators, their interviewees, first, and ask them just really broad, you know, kind of tell us your story as you want to tell it kinds of questions. And just listen to their collaborators tell the story in whatever way they wanted to tell it. Um, and then the students, Meg coached the students, then look for the things in the story that you think would make the most powerful, you know, five minute sequence for your person. Um, and then the students went back to their collaborators and said, these are the things that we thought were really striking, really special and important. We're wondering if you could talk about that again on camera this time. So it was sort of a double story process. One was kind of raw story, and then one was distilled story. Does that is that right? Did that yeah, roughly? that's how it went, and um, it was very helpful to have that um, instruction on how to do this. Yeah, there are materials out there on digital storytelling techniques, mm -hmm. and so Meg took some material and talked about, and she did even a simulation of interviewing somebody in the class and then saying, "Ooh." That piece that you mentioned, hmm, could you develop that a little more? So we're basically helping edit down the story for the most compelling piece. Again, recording the oral history first, and then hoping they feel comfortable with the cameras and the lights, which is no easy task, no easy feat. Uh, but it's getting to know the person. The more you can interact and have them feel comfortable, the better. And I will say language was an issue. Um, we had some Spanish speakers. A lot of people don't speak Spanish, so it's just figuring out how do you communicate effectively. And I will also say the students really, like, this was a lot for the students. It was a challenge. It was a lot. We did not, going in, understand fully how much we were asking of the students. And they felt, I think it's fair to say, maybe they felt a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, they really rose to the occasion, but it was, you know, it, we would want to do it differently. I think time. so. This is our first time. I'm really impressed with what the students did, but maybe we could build out more scaffolding next time, lengthen it out. This was, you know, a trial by fire. Yeah. <laughs> really, <laughs> truly. Was. Yes. Um, you spoke already a little about how hard it was to for them to learn the techniques and also get the, the interviewees comfortable with being recorded. But then on top of that, you're dealing with very sensitive information so can you speak to how you handle that? Because that was probably a learning curve for both parties. Do you want to say anything about that, Javette, in terms of the, your client and drawing her out? Because I know that was an issue. Yeah, so I worked with the, with the person, the second to last person who, um, whose child was to discovered to have cancer. And it was hard to get, uh, get her to open up um, and also get her used to being in front of the camera. So we had to do that session about six times like she just kept going again and again um, and at first it was really pared down she didn't want to talk about her reactions her emotions um, and then as she kept doing it then she kept like opening up a little bit more um, but even 
even at the end, it was hard to get her to talk about her child with cancer because it was just such an emotional moment for her and she didn't want to, you know, break down in front of the camera. So yeah, like what, she, she sounds very composed when she's speaking on the, on the camera, but she's actually, it actually doesn't, it doesn't reflect what she's actually um, feeling about it. So, but at, at the same time, it was good to like, protect what she, the image that she wanted to, to give of herself. So that's why we, that, that was sort of the process that we had to go through with her getting her to open up, but also like realizing that there's a limit to how much she, she wanted to open up. There's, I mean, an ethics of, yeah. there's an ethics of filmmaking. I mean, anthropologists are trained to know when and when they cannot ask the question. So it's really trying to be sensitive. And as I said earlier, this is a really precarious situation people are in. We want to protect their privacy. And the students, I thought, did an amazing job of gauging comfort level and seeing if they wanted to be filmed or not. Because these, these are people, right? So you have to be very sensitive. Very basic question. How does a student find out about this class and figure out that they'd like to take it? Mm -hmm. I'm uh, not academic. No, I mean, <laughs> that's an excellent question. Listen, we were just lucky that there was an opportunity that we could offer the class. More and more, the required classes have the weight and the currency, and Marta and I wanted to try something new. We had a really good crop of students who found out about it through advising. And we cross-listed it about seven different ways. I'm not exaggerating. It's true. It was film and media studies, English department, Latin American studies, undergraduate, graduate. It was cross-listed seven different ways. We really wanted to have enough students for this class to move forward. If you don't have a certain number, you have to cancel the class. So it just shows that there's a commitment on this campus. The students wanted to be there. They felt strongly. They care. So that's the lucky thing. I remember one student saying fairly early on, like about a third of the way into the semester, it was the course that I was looking for without knowing that I was looking for it. Like that, the subject matter, it was the topic I was looking for without knowing I was looking for it. Yes. Yeah, uh, the students are starting, we're always interested in what the students are learning from their classes, um, but also the lasting impact that this has had on students, like any of the sort of experiences I've been having on. So I'm interested in what you might say is lasting impact or things impacting the future? Yeah, um, this class definitely did have a very lasting impact in the way I see the experiences of people here. I mean, I am myself an immigrant, but I am not undocumented, so like seeing their experiences and seeing their what, what they go through, it was just, yeah, it really does make you understand in a way that another class couldn't. And meeting um, my collaborator, collaborator, like she was such a wonderful person and like getting to talk to her and her generosity and her bravery was just really, really impacting. It really was. Well, Jabet now works at the Center for Latin American Studies. I'd like to <laughs> say that. We you know, recruited her. <laughs> you her make in. connections, network, she's excellent. We're happy to have her. Yes. I was just curious to know how you involved the collaborators in the final production. Were they, did they all review the film when it was done? Did they offer comments or say like, um, like the way this ed edited didn't really re reflect what I was trying to say or anything like that? How were they involved? I mean, I think that's an excellent point and I wish we had had time to be able to do that. Um, they knew that we were going to screen the work at an event. They were invited to attend. But I think that's a great point. It would be great to get some feedback. I don't know if we've had a chance to show it. Um, I would hope that they feel that it's true to form. Um, but you're right, sometimes people are not happy with representations. So I appreciate that, that feedback. Actually. So that's not what happened when the, that there was the one person who had the six different versions. He filmed them six different times. It was, it was the same sitting though. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't yeah. because they viewed it in. <laughs> No, it was just that it's hard to, to speak in front of a camera. I mean, everyone has trouble. And so this group was just very patient and said, do you mind if we try again? How, does that, you know, how do you feel about it? And then it was just like, I remember you telling me. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's like the floodgates opened. There was a sense of calm and this incredible monologue. So it's just working with people. 
Any other questions? Yes. Well, you alluded to next time. And so can you just talk a little bit more about what that might well, look like or what your plans might be? I would love it if we could teach the class again. We both, now she's got three jobs, <laughs> two jobs, so it's a little bit dicey right now, but I mean, we don't want to give up the ghost. We started something. Um, it's just a question of how can we offer this again, and maybe what we could do for next time is offer training earlier on with the equipment. It's just getting more buy-in from my department. This was an experimental trial period. I think they now see, look, this is serious, look what we've done. How beneficial it is, and then build in more scaffolding, as I said. Would, they, would it uh, continue to be a partnership with Center and Spano, or would you potentially reach out to other community partners? Good question. I would, I would love it if we would continue to partner and work with them and see what they need, uh, but of course there are many nonprofits, and I know that our intermediate video production class always partners with nonprofits to make PSAs. So just know there are other spaces on campus where really good work is being done. I just wonder, I mean, it's so logistically obvious why you would look at films and make a film. And Marta, I wonder if you would say something about how um, being the student's exposure to literature functioned in this framework? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I it's It was an interesting class because I think that we both had our very strong disciplinary biases. And so as a person who, you know, has made her life's work studying text, um, I, for me personally, and for a lot of the lit students, I think, there's something about reading in privacy um, where your imagination is allowed to operate in ways that maybe, I, you know, I don't know. It's okay. You can <laughs> I don't want to offend the film studies person. It's, no, that's I, I do believe that your your mind engages with the story in a different way than in film. Um, and you know, there have been studies that show that um, people who read novels have a greater capacity for empathy. And so these, I, I talk about this when I teach the, um, when I teach classes like this and talk about um, like testimonio and literature that has a testimonial-like function that the kind of point of it is to move people to certain kinds of action or certain kinds of positions. Um, people are really different. So some people respond the way I do, more to imaginatively engaging with text, and some people really need the visual stimulation. And for some of the students, it really matters that it's nonfiction, that it's documentary, or that it's journalism, and they'll believe it more and be moved by it more when they know that it's true. And some other students are much more moved by, you know, novels that are based on history and historical fact, but it's fictional. I'm, so, I don't know, I think it's, there's a value in having a range of media that address the issue for students. And for our group, like, the way that we figured out the monologue was writing it down and, like, sketching out the story. So, like, having that combination was helpful. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I wonder if you would consider making a viewing list or a reading list, maybe from what you used in the class, that could kind of go with this film for, for people that want to find out. Yeah. Like a study you know, guide? Kind well, of, yeah. we could take everything that we read or saw and just make a big list of it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we take the syllabus. People for are those interested. Who, you know, aren't going to yeah. be able to take your class. Yeah. Sure. Once they see it, they're so interested. It's a great idea. Well, I'd like to think that, yeah, watching the films, it got them thinking about how do you create a story? It is a narrative. So you're seeing, you're getting exposed to a lot of things. Yeah, I'm sure we could do that. Nice In fact, you know, one of the first things that they saw was this, <laughs> this um, documentary that my sister made 25 years ago about the Cuban-American family, <laughs> a.k.a. my family. And she made it while she was in film school. But it was kind of an interesting... Um, thing for some of the students to see, okay, how do you make a, a homemade documentary? Um, and what do you do? It, it's interesting because in this, um, in this film, we really did stay focused on the faces. But in a lot of documentaries, you don't want a whole bunch of talking heads, right? You want something else going on while the people are talking. So just questions like that were interesting ones to consider. Any other questions? 
Yes. Uh, I don't have a question so much, just, but just to say that um, Marta and Tamara's research, you can read more about it Read more about it here in the gallery. They're both represented in the gallery, as well as Central Hispano. <coughs> on the website for um, this exhibition, we have a link to Central Hispano, and when you put your the film up, we'll be able to, um, that's another way we can point to it, so just by pointing to your site. So we'll be glad, you know, it's good to be able to promote that. But there's just so much of this work being done on our campus, and you can see a lot of it here. So I encourage everybody who hasn't had a chance to just walk through and to see. It's, again, the tip of the iceberg of what's happening here at KU. But this was really great, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And if you're interested in supporting Centro Hispano, Lydia's here. You could buy tamales. You could give money. Clearly, there's a need. So Can thank you all so much. Do you want to say anything? I want to say one more thing. Yeah. On my other hat, Interim Hall Center Director. Um, can I put in a plug for Maria Inoza, who's a um, very, very prominent Latina journalist who will be speaking on campus on Tuesday night yep. at 7.30. Um, and then also having a more informal conversation at 10 the next morning. Um, so if, if the topic is interesting to you, this will be directly related to that. Her talk is on... Latinos and immigration from a woman's perspective. Other hat. All right. Thank you all so much. Please grab some coffee and food on your way out. Otherwise, I'll eat all of it. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.